today on Mr. Nashville Talks, author, comedian, Saturday Night Live alumni, and one of my favorites, Miss Victoria Jackson. Hey everybody, today's show is going to be a blast because we have a guest that's one of the funniest people that you could ever imagine having on this show and we are so excited to have her. You'll know her because she's been on television for so many years and I'm a huge fan. I want to knock and see if she'll let us in. Victoria Jackson. There she Hello. is. <laughs> hey. Hi, Mr. Nashville. Hello, how are you? Thanks for coming over. And you got your rhinestones on? Nashville. That's right. Well, welcome. I'm so excited because we are visiting at her home. She's welcomed us into her home. One of my favorite people since I was a little bitty kid. I've loved Victoria Jackson. And thank you so much for having us here. And, and thank you for moving to Nashville. Well, I love Nashville. We've been here five years. Yes. And my whole family's here. All, we followed our grandchildren here. My mom's here now, and we're all here, and we're all starting to talk like that. <laughs> well, now, your voice is so uh, kind of your trademark in a lot of ways. And everybody that I've talked to, I know the answer to this, but everybody says to ask you, is that her real voice? Does she really talk like that? No, my real voice is this. <laughs> But you explained it one time that you actually had like a, a I had, medical... I was a temporary secretary when I was 20, 19, and the throat specialist I was working for kept looking at me weird. And then he said, can we examine your throat? And I was like, uh, sure. <laughs> and he said, because um, you have an unusual voice. And their conclusion was that I have congenital palatal insufficiency, wow. which means since birth my palate doesn't, I don't know what it means, but anyway, I got a D in speech at Auburn. Oh no! And, um, but I, and when I was a uh, secretary for my husband's father, who was a doctor. Oh, this is my bottle Sorry water. About that. This is our other guest, Hezekiah. Hezekiah <laughs> has a great name. Yes. I'll tell you all about it. Yeah. But um, where was I? Oh yeah, you, when I was the secretary for the doctor Wessel, he said my patients think that a child is answering the phone. <laughs> you are not permitted to answer the phone. You can only take dictation and type. So I got very fast at typing, but. All in all, I'm glad my voice is like this. Yeah, well, you know, you had such a, a, an incredible career uh, and still going strong, but a lot of people uh, went on SNL, which, you know, we know you from SNL, but you kind of were doing what a lot of people searched hard and hard and hard to do was get on Carson, and they worked so hard. You were on Carson before you were ever on SNL. I worked hard to get on Johnny yeah. Carson, too. Yeah. Uh, when I went to L.A., I I'm looking this way so yeah, my double chin doesn't show. So, yeah. no, I'm an actress. She's beautiful. I'm an actress. I don't have to look this way. <laughs> uh, so I was in L.A., Johnny Crawford, the little boy on the Rifleman, discovered me in Birmingham in the play Meet Me in St. Louis. He was the lead. I was in the course line doing back handsprings because I was a gymnast because my dad was a coach and <clears throat> he said I had a funny voice and he wanted me to be in his nightclub act in LA. So he sent me a one-way ticket to LA and I lived in a retirement home for room and board and blah blah blah. Got three jobs blah 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 and I thought how do I said Johnny how do I get an agent? I can't get any auditions unless I get an agent, right? And he goes, well, I can't even get an agent. And he was the rifleman's son. <laughs> so it's kind of a catch-22. You can't get one unless you get work, and you can't get work unless you get one. So I was like, all right. So I realized that stand-up comedy was a new thing in 1980, and there's very few women doing it. So I thought if I could make up a couple minutes... Uh, do it around town, maybe people would say, oh, she'd be a good airhead on our sitcom. <laughs> that, that's what I thought I was right. made for, and it's always eluded me. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't really meant for SNL. I'd never taken improv. I'd never been in Second City. I'd never been in the Groundlings. I'd never watched it because we didn't have a TV when I grew up. 
So it's kind of funny, the journey, you know. I just went through doors that opened and couldn't go through doors that closed. And long story short, I started doing a stand-up comedy act. I had no material, so the first thing I did was at open mic night at the comedy store, I did Lily Tomlin's Edith Ann routine. Oh, wow. And I had three minutes. One in the morning, that's when the nobodies get to go up on stage. There was only three drunk Japanese businessmen in the front row, no one else. And Mitzi, the owner, was in the back, in the shadows, with a couple young comics hovering around her. And I, I did, by the way, they had it out five and a half years old. I never asked to be bored. If I did, Bubba would have said no. I always kiss Buster right on the lips, but it is not pleasant. But come here, Buster. But sometimes I'll put mouthwash in his doggy water. It helps. If you love somebody, you could kiss them on the lips. You do not have to wash it off. See, I remember. You sound, yeah, it's Well, so I much memorized like it. her thing. I did it at the comedy store, and Mitzi goes, You never do someone else's material, especially if they're alive. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, I, I didn't know anything. Right. I was like, Oh, I have to make up my own material. So I started working on that. At the Variety Arts Center, I was the cigarette girl. I have a picture I could show you. Yeah. I had a cigarette tray. In, in the daytime, I worked at the American Cancer Society telling people <laughs> how to quit smoking. And at night, I was the cigarette girl selling cigarettes, but no one was buying them because in L.A. it was out of style in 1980. To, everyone's healthy there. And uh, so I was just like, a, you know, a, it was a 30s club. So I was like, cigarettes, cashews, nuts and butts. That's what the boss told me to say. And then I did a little act. Everyone who worked there, Milt Larson was the boss, and he was so nice. He, I said, can I do an act? And he goes, well, what do you do? And I said, well, um, I could hold a handstand and say poetry because of my gymnastics. I thought that's the only thing I can do that no one else in Hollywood could probably do. <laughs> and so I started doing that. I did it for two years, every night, and then the Tonight Show Talent Scout came to see another comedian and she told dirty jokes and in those days you couldn't get on NBC if you right. told her. Yeah. And so I came on after her and then they said, you want to be on the Tonight Show? And I was like, yes. So then Johnny Carson, he kind of got me. Yeah. The, the talent scout said, if Johnny gets you, you'll have a career. If he doesn't like you, I'm going to get fired. Jim <laughs> it's Mc true, yeah. The talent scout guy. And when he opened the curtain, when I went out for my first time, he was shaking. And, and I said, why are you shaking? He goes, because if Johnny doesn't like you, I get fired. Oh, wow. So, I don't know. Well, he's, you get, were on there 20 times. Yeah, I like So Johnny right. liked you. Yeah. Yes, that was good. I don't think Letterman liked me very much. It's funny you say because I watched some of the, you know, leading up to the the interview. I went back and watched some, and a lot of them I'd already seen, you know, when they actually aired. But I did notice there was he was actually kind of rude to you on the Carson show. He was rude he, to me on his show yeah. and the Carson show. Yeah, yeah. But and I don't think he got what you did. My my analysis is that Johnny Carson was the best because. Yes. I'll tell you why. Because they pre-interview you. Do you like my purple nails? Yeah, I love them. It's and I love your rhinestones for Nashville. Oh yeah, well I want yeah, to I love that. We're going to talk about, about that. Lavender hair. Yes. Okay. So Johnny Carson was the best because they pre-interview you. Yeah. And they said. Uh, who are you married to? I said a fire eater. And you know they're like a fire eater. <laughs> well. On the air, Johnny Carson said, so, who are you married to? And then I said, a fire eater. And I got a huge laugh. Yeah. On the other talk shows, the hosts wanted to take the laugh for themselves. So they said, so, I hear you're married to a fire eater. Big laugh. They got the laugh. And then I said, yes. No laugh. You yeah. see the difference? Yes, exactly. Johnny Carson was so gracious. He would set up the interview so that yeah. you got the laughs. Exactly. And I thought I was so funny when after I was on Carson. And then I'd go on other shows, and I wasn't that funny. It's because of Johnny. Yeah. Well, see, that's the thing. They they want 
a lot of people, uh, when you're interviewing them or, or, or whatever, they try to take over the interview for their FaceTime. Well, you're on the show every time it airs. Right. The guest is the most important person. Yeah. And that's how I've always felt about it. I think that uh, as long as they look That's why he's Mr. Good. Nashville! <laughs> <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> I love that. Well, now, um, when you were on the show, on, on SNL, um, because you were a Christian and you'd been to Bible college and, and all these things, you never really changed who you were. Mm -hmm. And that seems kind of like a, it must have been a tough, tough environment to kind of work in, you know, with all the New Yorkers at the time. Being, and I'm mm -hmm. sure that they were not all Christian people mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Did they ever give you any flack over your... Well, when I first moved to L.A., I got the feeling that everyone was pretty open. Yeah. And it was all about, uh, are you funny? Yeah. And when I got on SNL, Lorne Michaels liked my audition and hired me because he thought I was funny. And when my faith in Jesus Christ, not my faith, right. my faith in Jesus Christ yeah. uh, came up occasionally... Um, you know, nobody, nobody was really that mean to me. I, about three people at SNL seemed like they didn't like me because of that. But most of the people respected my work ethic and we had fun and they just wanted me to be funny. That's good. It's just like, go to work, be funny, think of something funny, which was really hard for me. I'd sit at my typewriter like... And then Dana Carvey was writing The Church Lady and John Lovitz was writing The Liar. And, you know, that's the ticket. Um, uh, uh, isn't that special? Yeah and, yeah. and, you know, and I'm like, how do you do that? And um, so I was there six years. Super great time. Very stressful. Very competitive. And uh, changed my life. And. I appreciate Lauren Michaels for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, I know. I, I watched an interview with you one one time, and you said that you didn't feel like you were doing enough uh, on the on the show. And Lauren said, "I don't think you realize how much of your presence, uh, you know." Right. And it's true. When you walked on, it was like you were the character. You were mm. the the comedy was there because you were. You were always on, if that You've makes sense. You've done your homework. Yeah. Oh, I watched you. No oh. joke. Since I was a kid, oh. I, I watched you on Carson. Because mm -hmm. there's two shows. I, you know, I stayed up late and watched Carson. And then SNL, which I probably shouldn't have been watching SNL at the time. I was, it was at a my lot, age. It was cleaner back then. It really was. Yeah, it was. And it was very... The thing that I loved about SNL in the past, they... Nobody was uh, better than anybody else. They went after everybody. You gotta show oh, the dog. Oh, isn't that cute? <laughs> isn't that sweet? She's adorable. He's at the foot of his master. <laughs> but yeah, I think that, that that SNL at that time was was more. Uh, they nothing was off limits. I mean, nobody was off limits. To where now, I think you know they center in more on things. Uh, They're you know, too political. Exactly. They're too biased. Yeah. And there's a lot of hate and anger coming out when it used to yeah. be more everyone could be made fun of, not just one side. Yeah. <laughs> I remember Especially, you did a song called I Am Not a Bimbo or something. Yes, that was and, my best thing. Uh, yeah, and is that the one where you did the handstand on, on the... Uh, the bimbo one, I did a half strip to okay. make fun of Jessica Hahn, who yes. I later met. And she's a super really? nice person. Oh, yeah. Very I knew sweet. Tammy Faye and Jim. I knew both of them, yeah. Yeah. I love Tammy She Finn. was a doll. And, uh, I, so, I love them all. Yeah. Well, you know, but they, they, were good to, they were good cartoon figures. Oh, yeah. They must have been. Everybody back then. Zsa Zsa. And, and yeah. you did the, the most perfect Zsa Zsa. Can you do a little bit of it? Or is it Darling, too Darling, I work all over the world. And I just want to be with you. I didn't want to slap a cop. I wanted to spank him. <laughs> so that was in my act. And then people were like, you better update your act a little bit. I'm like, why? Everybody knows who Zsa Zsa is, don't they? I, I love all the characters. You know, back then the, there were stars. You know, where now you have celebrities. There mm. were stars back, you know, yeah. up until the 90s I guess and then when you know they started to get into more of the reality culture I guess yeah. and everything but on a serious note you went through some real tough times recently you 
you've had uh, health issues, I'll let you tell it. Mm -hmm. And but you come through and and you're doing well. And I hate to, I don't want to say what you went through. I'll let you tell that. Oh. But well, I um, I never went to the doctor. I was never sick. And uh, one day I was coughing and it wouldn't stop. And I had to do my stand-up show at Zany's Nashville. And I couldn't stop coughing. And somehow I got through it. And the next day I went, okay, this is ridiculous. I have to go. I went to the walk-in clinic. And the male nurse named uh, Gordon, he, I said, is, the, is there's a little numb spot right there? Is that like my lymph nodes fighting the cough? And he goes, I'm sending you directly to the Vanderbilt Breast Clinic. And I said, why? I don't have a lump or anything. It's not in my family. You had hereditary. And uh, he goes, no, that's where my wife goes. And I was like, goes? And so, like, you have to go a lot. <laughs> and I went there, and they said I had the most common type of breast cancer. Oh. And I was 50, uh, this was 2015. I was 50-something. And um, so it had double mastectomy, uh, radiation, chemo for five months, uh -huh. went bald, and I have always uh, known Jesus since I was six. I was like, Lord, I've read your word, memorized it, talked about it my whole life. Now I'm going to have to put it into action. Now I'm going to have to live it. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Lord. Uh, so I was like, okay, God, it's a win-win. If you heal me in heaven or if you heal me here, um, it's all good. Yeah. So I thought, I want to show the world how a Christian dies with joy because why be afraid of death, right? So I went through this journey for a year. And I wrote about it because I'm creative. I have like urges to write a song or, well, usually whatever something's bothering me or pain, I always say uh, uh, the best art comes from pain. Yeah. But anyway, because, um, you know, stand up routines, it seems like most of the people who do stand up, they're just complaining about something that right. bothers them or something yeah. they hate. And that's how I made up my stand-up routine and uh, done it for 20 years. Basically the same routine. <laughs> I try to add new stuff, but um, it's very hard. People don't realize mm -hmm. it's really hard to gather 45 minutes of jokes. Right, yeah. And uh, even Seinfeld made a movie about how hard it was to start over and try to make a new set. But anyway... Um, so I wrote down a lot of my journey and how Jesus helped, carried me and my husband through it. He just carried us through it. And when I w was on chemo and I was too weak to change the TV channel, I would uh, quote Psalm 23 or sing it, or I would play um, My Redeemer Lives on my laptop by Nicole C. Mullen. Oh, I love her. Yeah, yeah. or I would play uh, River of My Life, Light Upon My Path by Stormy O. Martin. Mm. Do you say O. Martian? Well, yeah, I think uh, I, I say it wrong, you know, yeah. so ever. I say it's totally and Debbie wrong. Selby was singing it. But uh, do you know she used to date Steve Martin? No, I didn't know that. Sto Stormy O. Martian. <laughs> and I read all his books. And some of hers, and uh, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, so I wrote it, and then I, to encourage people, and to mostly to, to spread the gospel, which is the good news that Jesus died for our sins, rose from the grave, so we can too. And, um, yeah, so, and then I wrote two of my best favorite songs while I had cancer, and I wrote three cancer jokes. Would you like to hear some Yeah, of them? yeah. Okay, so Lavender Hair was one of the songs I wrote. I'll sing you a little. Yeah, you yeah, I love that. Okay, this was because my husband was trying to make me feel pretty and he didn't know how because I was not pretty. And uh, my friend Judy, at my birthday, I said, oh, my hair's growing back in, but it's gray. And she said, it's not gray, it looks lavender. And my husband went, yeah, yeah, it looks, it looks lavender. Yeah, yeah, it lavender. And I thought, out of the corner of my eye, I thought, that's so cute. He's trying to make me feel pretty. <laughs> and um, 
basically, he, he said I looked like a androgynous drill sergeant. <laughs> That's one of my jokes. Uh, because it was like a little bit of gray grown in you. And uh, my other joke is, a lot of people ask me, did breast cancer affect the romance in your marriage? And I say, no, because even though uh, I was bald and my chest looked like it went through a wood chipper, my husband's a leg man. <laughs> I love that joke. Yeah, that's a great one. People said wood chipper is too harsh. So I should say, even though I look like a surfboard and I was bald, my husband's a leg man. But either way, yeah. I think it's very clever. Very clever, yeah. Yes, and so anyway, this was Lavender Hair. He sees me as soft, dig, not heavy. He hears me as wise and not dull. He thinks that I'm super terrific when others think nothing at all. It goes like that. I love that. So that's an ode to my husband because it's hard on the husband too. And my uh, doctor said that um, weak marriages don't make it through breast cancer. And uh, me and my husband have a very, what would you call it, a challenging <laughs> marriage. 26 years. He is my high school sweetheart. We got reconnected after I was married to the fire eater. Then my other song I wrote during my cancer. You want yeah, to hear a yes, little bit? Yes, yeah. Okay. So this one's called, It's a Broken World, Baby! <laughs> Tattoo of a broken ukulele. Light blue turquoise lies. He might leave me in the middle of my chemo. I would not be so surprised. Yeah, I got cancer and so did my dog. Sink has a claw. My checks are bouncing, but my trampoline's torn. I am not surprised because I've been warned. It's a broken world, baby. I know you agree. The second law of thermodynamics says the world is in a state of entropy. That's a fancy word for broken, you see. But do we have time for the rest? Yeah. Well, I'll just sing. Okay. Lanny's back is causing him pain. Bob's OCD is driving Donna insane. Gilbert's dad, he needs a diagnosis. I quit kissing Daisy because she had some halitosis. Daisy, <laughs> Daisy was my dog. I just, my heart is broken and I stubbed my big toe. I just got fired and my food is GMO. I accidentally stepped onto my ukulele. Rushing to say hi to my new neighbor, the Israeli. <laughs> well, you try to rhyme with ukulele. <laughs> it's a broken world, baby. Since even Adam gave in. But there's a new world coming. That's why my song has a grin. That's why my song has a grin. Jesus is coming soon. I love that. Well, you are a gift. I tell you, uh, God really blessed us with you because you are able to reach people and just plant a little seed or a nugget into people who may never step into a church. So I, I think you don't really know how much of a gift you are. Well, I, that's you are my... so loved. I mean, you really are. Oh, thank you for you saying are. that. And I've loved you, like I said, all, all Gosh, I can't remember when I didn't even know who you were, mm. you know, and, and so I followed your career. I'm not just saying that because you're on the show. I mean, I hunted to try to get you on the show when I found out that you lived here. You did yes, hunt me down. Yes, I did. I finally found, found something. me. <laughs> well, I'm easy to find if you try hard enough. Yes, right. Well, I thought, you know, sometimes people, if they don't know you too, that it's... Yeah, yeah, I didn't know, you yeah. know, because we were new here, and yeah. so nobody knew us, and we didn't know anybody, and... Now we're getting to sort of be Nashvilleians. Well, what what's new? What do you what do you have in the works that you? 
well, I see you got some CDs. And well, what I'm, I'm doing now is I'm writing a new album. Awesome. Whether anyone wants me to or not. <laughs> and uh, my friend Jim McBurney, he's a retired cop from New York. He talks like this, him and his wife. She's teaching me how to quilt, and he's recording my songs in his house on all of his machines. Wow. And so whenever we get the time, we, we're recording like, you know, my songs. Because since I moved here, I had a fresh crop of inspiration. Yes. And so my goal before I die, my last thing on my bucket list, because I've done everything I ever yeah. wanted to do. I saw Paris for one day. <laughs> I was on TV. That was my goal. I, I married my high school sweetheart. That was my goal. I had children. That was my goal. Lord blessed me so much. Yes. And the only thing left is I want to sing at the Grand Old Opry. Oh, we need to get you on there. That would be perfect. I want to sing at the Grand Old Opry. Yes. And you know they you, have... Do you have connections, some, Mr. Nashville? Some, some. I'm, I mean, I may not be as connected as other people, but I know people who... Yes, you I'll, I'll check around. Yeah. Well, don't you think they that would, would like great. my broken world? I think babe? they would love that. And plus, you know, they have... They even have comedy acts come on. Yeah. You know, they so. need a little comedy in between the real singers. Yes. And I have the perfect song. Okay. Are you going to edit this out? No. We won't. Are you going to edit all my songs? No, in? we're going to leave them in there. Unless yeah. you don't want us to. No, I want to yeah. get discovered. Yes, we're going to put them on the there. <laughs> this is my costume. I couldn't find the right bow, but it's similar to this. Okay. okay. Okay, this is my last song. Okay. But I was just thinking, this is so perfect for the Grand Old Opry. I did a movie with Ray Stevens about four years ago, and it was in Shreveport, and uh, it, was, it was a comedy, and when I was on the set for hours, I told him and his uh, songwriting partner, Buddy Kalb, Cyrus Buddy Kalb, about this song and then buddy made it way better and um and this is what i would first sing if okay. i ever got on the grand Ole Opry because i think it's a universal theme that whenever you move here you get the fever yes like i didn't have the fever till i moved here and in the air everybody's writing songs okay yeah. when i get to nashville i'm gonna make the rounds i'll do a show on music or Tootsie's Orchid Lounge I'll get booked at the Bluebird It's hard but I know I will I'm gonna be a country star When I get to Nashville I mean when I get to Nashville When I get to Nashville I'm gonna make a splash I'll dress up all in sequins Or in black like Johnny Cash Or let Manuel make me something swell Give them all a thrill When I get to Guitar Town, I'll show them something, something that, something that they never saw. Oh, yeah. eh. When I get to Nashville, <clears throat> I'm gonna knock them dead. I'll be the only country singing star who can sing standing on her head. Play my ukulele at the Opry and make their hearts stand still. I'm gonna be a country star. I'm gonna be a country star. I'm gonna be a country star. Everybody has a gimmick. I mean, Dolly Parton has a gimmick. She has two gimmicks. That's right. I mean, I'll have three because I can do a handstand. Um, you know, if Dolly Parton did a handstand, she'd probably suffocate herself. <laughs> Thank you! You got to do uh, SNL with Dolly. I did. You all, but they, they, you all did like something together musically How do you too. Know that? Saw the picture, and they cut it out, didn't he they? He did his homework. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, well, in this book, I tell a few, I tell a few secrets. Uh, um. Uh, this is called, Is My Bow Too Big? And it's how I went from SNL to the Tea Party. 
because I was trying to explain the Tea Party to people who only believed uh, CNN. <laughs> and you can't just believe it. There's a lot of good pictures in here. But um, people always said, how did you get on SNL? Or how did you get on SNL? So I thought, well, I will answer them. Yeah. And I told them every detail. Yeah, and here's some songs. Yeah, we want to see all your CDs. This is uh, 20 of my funny songs I sang on TV. This is my children's album. And another children's album. And I'm selling a movie, uh, my stand-up, and I made a documentary. And uh, it's called, what's it called? I forgot. I forgot. Anyway, it's for sale on my website. And what, what is the website? So I don't know. And we'll John put it on Lovett, the bottom. Kevin Nealon and John Lovitz are in my documentary. Oh, wow. And there's a there's a guy trying to sell my movie right now to Netflix. Um, what do you call those people who try to sell your movie? They have a name. Uh, Distributor. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he's trying to sell it to Netflix. And um, I forgot the name of it. And, um, oh, VictoriaJackson.com. We want to give you, we, we have these new t-shirts, and so we give them all to our guests, and it might be big, oh, but you... I, I need it big. Yeah, well... Oh, look how cute! So, so what, what was the name of your movie? Before we go, the... the or you don't have a name the for it yet? The yeah. documentary? Is it about your life, or...? The only show in town. And it's about my whole career, and what's the most important thing in life, and... Uh, me on the road and oh that's great yeah well I love it I can't wait to watch it and I know everybody else will want to watch it too and and we want you to get all the CDs that are on the website and start a whole Victoria Jackson library but this has been so fun and, uh, and for you to welcome us into your home is even more special and, now and I share have to your show life you my roses and my yes. jungle room okay that sounds fun. Yeah. And we thank you so much. This really does mean a lot to us. Thank and I you. appreciate it. I could sit and talk to you all day. I feel like we're old Me friends. Too. So we are. So I love this. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. You too. Subscribe to our mailing list and you could win a CD or DVD project by today's featured artist. To enter, please go to www.mrnashvilletalks.com and enter your email address. While there, take a look around, browse through our music store, or order one of our Mr. Nashville Talks t-shirts for $20. I want to hear from you, so follow our social media via Twitter, Instagram, or like us on our Facebook page.